You know, the right wing never gives up attacking me. Have you noticed that? <laughs> Honest to goodness, I think, I think they're, they're really going to throw everything, including the kitchen sink this time. But I, I have a little message for them. They've done it for 25 years, and I'm still standing. Well, Hillary Clinton didn't win in West Virginia, but she's uh, closer than ever to clinching the Democratic nomination for president. Bernie Sanders came out on top in the Mountain State, but since the Democrats there award the delegates proportionally, Clinton is now about 150 shy of the majority of delegates to clinch the nomination. Meanwhile, Donald Trump is the only Republican left standing, so he chalked up an easy victory in West Virginia, winning by nearly 70 percentage points. Trump also scored big in the winner-takes-all Nebraska, finishing far ahead of Ted Cruz and John Kasich. Well, joining us here in L.A. is James Lacey, the author of Taxifornia and a Trump supporter. And in San Diego, Mike Slater, a conservative radio talk show host and, yeah, I guess, a Ted Cruz guy. <laughs> Still, welcome, maybe. gentlemen. Thank you guys for being here. <laughs> okay, we've got the terms with it all. <laughs> the, the, you go through the steps, mate. You'll be fine. Uh, we've got the big meeting coming up in Washington between Paul Ryan and Donald Trump. There's been a lot of back and forth between these two. Donald Trump now seems to be trying to make nice with the House Speaker Paul Ryan. This is what he said to the Wall Street Journal. I have a lot of respect for Paul, and I think we're going to have a very good meeting. He's a very good man. He wants what's good for the party, and I think we're going to have very positive results. Did you and I'd love, frankly, for him to stay and be chairman. It was actually Fox News, though, mm. um, but whatever. Okay. James, how crucial is this meeting, though, now between uh, you know, Donald Trump and Paul Ryan? How much is riding on these two men sorting out this issue and sorting it out quickly? Yeah, I think that it's going to be sorted out, and I think it's important that they have this visual of getting together. But the Republican Party's coming together while the Democratic Party is falling apart. You now have a situation where Hillary Clinton, who has lost 20 primary elections, is looking at losing again in Oregon and now having to use resources to spend in Kentucky. We could have a situation where she comes to California and she's looking at a very tight, perhaps 23rd state loss. I'm reminded of what Hunter S. Thompson said, uh, to paraphrase him, when he explained why the Democrats put uh, uh, George McGovern up against uh, Richard Nixon and lost. He said, you don't send a three-toed sloth in to fight a wolverine. Well, Donald Trump is our wolverine, and it looks like Hillary Clinton is becoming the three-toed sloth. Now, now, James, that might sound to some as a diversionary tactic yeah. that, you know, the GOP has <laughs> plenty of problems of its own before you go through uh, throwing stones. Uh, Mike, to, to bring you in here, uh, Paul Ryan, uh, as John just pointed out, uh, all eyes on him. Uh, he's been speaking to the Wall Street Journey Journal, I should say, uh, talking about the issue of unity, looking ahead to Thursday. Take a listen. And so I think what we want to do is sit down together and talk about how we can unify the Republican Party so that we can be at full strength in the fall. Because if we just pretend we're unified without actually unifying, then we'll be at half strength in the fall and that won't go well for us. So Mike, let me ask you a question I've asked others. Who's the onus on to make nice come Thursday? Is it more on Paul Ryan or is it on Donald Trump? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think Donald Trump has the upper hand. Um, so any other candidate in any other election would want to make nice with the new Speaker of the House, right? But we know that this is not like any other election and Donald Trump's not like any other candidate. I don't know what he gets out of making nice with Paul Ryan. First of all, I don't think Paul Ryan is like the soul of the Republican Party. Uh, I don't think people really look at him that way. And I don't know what Donald Trump gets out of it. Like, I think the conflict is actually good for him. It, it, it um, solidifies his outsider status. And again, Trump has the upper hand. Remember in the Wisconsin primary, Trump won Paul Ryan's district. So Trump in Paul Ryan's hometown, yeah. Trump is more liked than Paul Ryan. I think that's true nationwide <laughs> too. Right. I guess, James, to you, though, does Donald Trump need the Republican Party? Because the question here is, what about the donors? Are yeah. the donors sitting on the sidelines the until this gets sorted out? Yeah. Well, Donald Trump um, reflects the voters. And so there's Paul Ryan, there's Donald Trump, and there are millions and millions of angry voters out there that have seen in Donald Trump's campaign a ray of hope 
from the problems of unemployment, from the lack of growth, from the grossly high taxation that the Obama administration, you know, 39% marginal rate. Here in California, when you add the 11% that the Democrats put on uh, on the state, it's over 50% marginal taxes. Voters are angry. They want to change. And I think that uh, Donald Trump is reflecting that. And I, and I agree with my friend Mike Slater. I've been on his radio show. Great guy. The reality here is, is that Donald Trump and the voters are what matters. And I think that Paul Ryan will understand that and that they'll work together. Okay, I want you to both, both listen to a portion of this interview that Marco Rubio gave to our Jack Tapper. First uh, national interview since dropping out of the race. He doesn't want to be Trump's VP and he still can't even really bring himself to mention the name Trump. <laughs> There are a lot of questions about the Republican Party and where it goes from here. And, and first and foremost, there's this claim from the Trump campaign that advisors of yours have been pitching you hard to the Trump campaign to be his running mate, that you really want the job, according to these Trump campaign officials talking about these advisors. What's your position on this? Well, it would be impossible because I don't really have very many advisors around. Our campaign is no longer running. And unless they've been talking to my wife, which is my critical advisor these Does days. Does she want you to be Mr. No. Trump? I've, like I said yesterday, look, I think Donald has won. The, he's won the, he's the presumptive nominee at this point. And, uh, but he, he'd be best served by having someone, not just by the way a vice presidential nominee, but active surrogates who agree with him on his issues. My differences with Donald, both my reservations about his campaign and my policy differences with him are well documented and they remain. And I think he would be best served by having people close to him and his campaign that are enthusiastic about the things he stands for. I interviewed Speaker Ryan Thursday, as you probably saw, and he said he couldn't endorse Donald Trump right now. Is that what you're saying or no, that's not well, what you're saying? Well, the difference between uh, Speaker Ryan and myself is I ran for president. I signed a pledge, put my name on it, and I said I would support the Republican nominee. And that's what I intend to do. And I think, but the best thing I can do to do that, I think, is to support those who are out there running uh, for the conservative cause, whether it's to keep a conservative majority in the Senate or, or in the House, for that matter, and, and across the country at different levels. And, and what I don't want to do and what I'm not going to do is sit here for the next six months and, and as I said, take shots at the Republican nominee. I, I ultimately I believe he has earned and I respect the will of the voters and I believe he's earned the opportunity to go out and make his case to the American people without having people in his own party taking shots at him every day. I understand that. But it does seem like you're trying to kind of walk this. Well, it's a very for... unique situation and I understand, uh, you know, it's Are not you gonna like vote any for other him? campaign. Well, as I said, I'm going to, I'm going to support the Republican No, you're going to abide by, the, by, his, by your pledge, but are yeah. you, when you go into the privacy of the voting booth, are you going to pull the well, I intend to support the Republican nominee, and I think that in, you know, includes, includes the entire process. Including, well, I'm not voting for Hillary Clinton. Okay. I'm not throwing away my vote. <laughs> okay, Marco Rubio speaking with Jake Tapper earlier. So, Mike, to you, the longer this division goes on, the long, longer these people hedge their bets and, you know, this, this disunity goes on, how much harder does it make for the Republicans and Donald Trump to win the election? Guys, this is a really interesting point here. I wonder how much of this is fun to talk about but doesn't matter. I don't mean to be rude, but... Like, I don't know any conservatives or Republicans who are on the edge of their seats waiting for Marco Rubio to give them permission to support Donald <laughs> Trump. Do you know what I mean? Like, so we talk about unity of the party, but when it comes to Trump supporters, it's really about unity between me, a person, and Donald Trump, the candidate. That's the unity that matters, and no one doubts that that unity exists. This, like, vague unity of, like, bringing Marco Ruby into it and the other 15 people who Trump obliterated during the last eight months. Like, I don't think Trump or candidate or supporters of Trump even care what those other 16 people want or will do. So I don't know. I don't know if unity matters that much because there's unity between Trump supporters and Trump. All right, James, I want to ask you very quickly about this whole issue of the VP pick because Rubio did, you know, rule himself out and he's in good company. A number of people have. Why are so many people running away from serving as a Trump VP or being on the ticket? Well, and what does that point to? Well, maybe Marco Rubio is uh, stepping back from it. But, you know, there's really no rush to do this. I mean, my God, Trump hasn't even won the California primary He yet. says he has a short list, by the way. Well, uh, it's good that he has a short list, but where is the rush here? I think that the American people are tired of the politics as usual, the back rooms, the smoke-filled rooms. You know, Mitt Romney going into a room with Jeb Bush and deciding who's going to run for president uh, in this election. I think that Trump can take his time, and I think that taking his time is actually a good thing. I think the vetting process is a good one. He has Ben Carson involved in it. It's uh, uh, a process that I think uh, 
will help to bring party unity because people will be coming to the Trump campaign um, to put their credentials forward. But I think at the end of the day, with the, you know, the, Donald Trump's a smart man and I think he's got good advisors, I think he's going to end up with a really good nominee that will help to unify the party as well. And mm -hmm. we'll leave it on that we note. James be. Lacey there James. with us here in Los Angeles, Mike Slater, uh, our good friend there in uh, San Diego. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Time for a quick break now and you're watching CNN special election coverage when we return.